Okay. Good day, everyone. My name is Frederick Hampton. I'm associate professor at Cleveland State University and interim chair of the Castle Department. Uh, this morning, we are talking about an exciting event that's coming up, the Teen Mental Health and Safety Summit, which will be held on October 10 at the Rocket um, Mortgage Field House, home of the Cleveland Cavaliers. And this is a very important issue to one of our favorite players, um, Kevin Love. So this morning for this podcast, as um, we'll talk about teen mental health and safety, we have guests. Uh, one guest is Dr. Dakota King-White, professor of counseling at Cleveland State University, Mrs. Marion Armstrong, uh, counselor at Palmer City High School, and Professor Kathy McCluskey, professor of counseling at Cleveland State University. So to get us started, um, I'd like for Dr. King White to talk to us and provide just kind of a big picture overview of teen mental health issues in Ohio and across the, the United States. Thank you, Dr. Hampton. So some of the things that we're seeing around teen mental health right now are just like the normal things around ADHD, anxiety, depression. So when we think about this from a national perspective, we've seen some of these things come up, especially due to the pandemic. Um, some of the other things when we think specifically around Ohio, and I think we all just have to be mindful of this, is just the access to services. So NAMI, the National Alliance of Mental Illness, they talk a lot about access and making sure that teens have access to those services Another thing that comes up for a lot of our teens, too, are around um, suicide ideation. So we've had to deal with that a lot, and schools are seeing some of these concerns when we think about it from a national, but also specifically around in Ohio. Um, the other thing that they've noticed, too, NAMI, has, they've done a lot of work, and they've talked about this, too, is students who are coming in depressed in schools that a lot of times they don't seek access outside of schools. So also the importance of making sure their children are getting the needs met within the K-12 schools. So this is a very important topic. Okay, thank you, Dr. King-White. Um, now we'll move to our next guest, Mrs. Miriam Armstrong, who is actually the uh, impetus and the developer and has uh, created uh, the background for the Teen Mental Health and Safety Summit. So Mrs. Armstrong, how about telling us about the background and development of this? Thank you very much, and thank you for having me today. Um, I've been very fortunate my 34 years at Parma City Schools is that um, the Parma City School District is very supportive of social-emotional learning. So we've been able to do a lot of different things with therapeutic groups, with individual counseling, and especially this mental health ambassador program that we started about five years ago. And uh, what happened is, is it's grown to um, encompass all three high schools. So we have over 100 students in our district that are, are counted as mental health ambassadors. And what their job is, is to basically notice other people. Um, kids tell me all the time that they feel invisible. Mm -hmm. And what a horrible way to come to school and feel invisible all day. And the job of a mental health ambassador is to pay attention. Is their job is to pay attention to those people who seem lonely, to those people who seem sad, and to those people who just need a, a friend or a helping hand. So what we do is we meet monthly with our students and we teach them about resiliency. We teach them about suicide warning signs, about suicide ideation. We teach them about um, conflict resolution. We teach them basically just a, a lot of different things about mental health during the holidays. NAMI comes in and they'll do a whole program on holiday blues and how that a lot of that stuff is typical mm -hmm. and when does it come from typical into um, diagnosable issues and how can we help those people one of the things that we're very careful to di differentiate with our kids is that we are not training them to be therapists mm -hmm. their job is to pay attention and to be a bridge to a helping adult all of our mental health ambassadors are wonderful individuals who really are caring and they want to help, but with their life experience, they may not have the tools necessary in order to get kids to the right place and get them the help that they truly need. And so while we are giving them tools in their toolbox, we are making sure that they understand that they do need to share that information. We do not keep secrets as mental health ambassadors. 
So our, our program has been growing for the last five years, and we're very, very proud of our kids. One of the things that they do pay attention to is social media, because that's not something as a staff that we can pay attention to. And they will bring anything concerning to us so that we can address that with families and parents. Um, this year, or actually last school year, we had um, Brexville reached out to me and said, you know, we saw you on the news because Holly Strano has been a great champion for us through Channel 3 News. And would you be willing to help us start a mental health ambassador program? Mm -hmm. And I said, sure, why not? That sounds like fun. Mm -hmm. And three days later, um, Cleveland Heights reached out to me, asked me the same question. So I then reached out to Dr. King White and Dr. McCluskey and said, what do you guys think about partnering and starting a program and training a thousand kids through the district to have hope and resiliency and take that message back to their school mm -hmm. and teach resilience? Yeah. Okay, so Miriam, uh, at your high school in particular, how many mental health ambassadors do you have right now? Right now in our building, we have about 35. I think after the summit, we're going to have some more. Mm -hmm. um, when they've heard Kevin Love Fund, they, a <laughs> lot of kids are like, can I join now? Um, so we're excited. That's the more the merrier, the more conversation we can have around mental health, and the more conversation we can have around hope and resiliency, I think the better our community will be. Okay. And one more question for you, Miriam. How are you going to think about what is program success? going to look like in your opinion? Program success. I never thought I'd look forward to October 11th <laughs> before because <laughs> this is a huge endeavor. Um, we've got a lot of wonderful community partners. Um, the Adams Board has partnered with us. Recovery Resources has partnered with us. Education Service Centers partnered with us. Riley's Angels, Ohio Guidestone. So success is getting that information out to our families in our city mm -hmm. so that they understand that there are places that our kids can go for help. Um, our district is partnered with Ohio Guidestone and we have in-school therapy. A lot of people don't understand that they, they have that right in their schools. Mm -hmm. So the more information we can get out to our families and the more we can start conversations about about mental health and it's okay to not be okay and have that conversation that's to me is successful okay mm -hmm. that was really good. important it's okay <laughs> to not be okay <laughs> thank you for that mm -hmm. okay now we'll move to dr kathy mccluskey again professor of counseling at cleveland state university so dr mccluskey talk to us about the um, public mental health model and wellness sure so we, uh, the, the public health model basically identifies prevention as the most efficient way to address all manner of type, different types of disorders, whether they're physical, emotional, mental, and so on. Um, and, and in our program, in the school counseling program at Cleveland State, we train people to become school counselors according to a model that's been established by the American School Counseling Association, and ASCA for short. And ASCA advocates that school counseling needs to address three broad aspects of student development. One of them is academic, one of them is career development, and the other one is the social emotional piece. And so, you know, a lot of people are probably very familiar with the academic aspect of school counseling, but there has been an increased need for focus on social and emotional development for all of the reasons that Dr. King White and Mrs. Armstrong just were mentioning. So the Centers for Disease Control has noted an increased in anxiety and depression among kids over the last decade. And right now, suicide is actually the second leading cause of death in adolescence between the ages of 10 and 14, as well as it's, an, it's one of the top three causes of death for kids between the ages of 15 and 19. So even though there's been a rise in mental health issues for children and the adolescent population, the rates of mental health service access, what Dr. King White just was talking about, have not increased. And so there's, there's a shortage of, of mental health workers, there's a shortage of services that are available to people who are struggling, and there is more people struggling now, as, you know, in particular because of the pandemic. So this has resulted in, in an increased need to kind of push and integrate mental health services into the K through 12 school setting, um, as, as Mrs. Armstrong was talking about. So using tools like this mental health ambassadors program that, that she's developed is such a powerful way to teach students how to be aware of their own mental health and how to be aware of mental health in the friends and family members around them. So just like uh, when you're traveling on an airplane and the flight attendants are instructing you that you should always 
put your own, own mask on before you try to help somebody else with the oxygen mask. That's kind of the approach that we take training our students in the counseling program and also training our students in the mental health ambassadors program, which is that they need to um, be aware of their own mental health and, you know, what things that they can do to take care of themselves emotionally. And then also to be able to recognize signs and symptoms in people around them and to know how to get them hooked up to get services and get help. So a program like this facilitates getting help to kids before things get really bad and even potentially to get help for a student thinking about doing something harmful to themselves or to somebody else. And the kids mm-hmm. often see it, see some of these symptoms in their peers before adults notice it. So, you know, as we think about, you know, some of the recent episodes of, of horrific school violence that we've seen, you know, I, I wonder how many of those types of things we can kind of um, prevent or, you know, intervene before things come to the place of, of bodily harm to people by, by training kids in some of these skills. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, thank you, Dr. McCluskey. So now for all of our guests, uh, in addition to this very important Team Mental Health and Safety Summit that's coming up October 10 at the um, Rocket Mortgage Fieldhouse, let's talk a little bit more about how the broader community can participate in, in supporting Team Mental Health. Mm-hmm. And uh, no one in particular, so whoever would like to talk about it. Yeah. So I think Ms. Armstrong, she talked a lot about the partners um, who are partnering with the Team Mental Health Summit, and those partners are amazing. So we know that we cannot do this work alone, especially when we think about the K-12 through systems. A lot of times in our K-12 through schools, the burden is on the school counselors, the social workers, the school psychologists, the teachers. Um, so those community partners are extremely important. Some of the ones that uh, Ms. Armstrong also talked about were our community agencies who come into the schools to provide support and those agencies have been amazing some of them actually provide individual counseling sessions in schools small groups so when we think about those community partners we always encourage K-12 through schools to partner with agencies and organizations um, even like some of the hospice organizations who come in and provide grief work and things like that so community partners are a very important component to the work that we do in K-12 schools okay so Dr. King White are you suggesting that in nearly any community, anyone who has mental health needs has access to mel- to mental health services? Would you go that far? So I think it depends, right? So I think we have to be mindful of the, org- the agencies and the p- people that we have access to. Um, I know in some of the rural areas, there are, there's less less access, and I think we have to be mindful of that as well. So I often say, and we say this all the time in our school counseling program here at Cleveland State, when, they, when our students go into schools, they need to be aware of the community partners and have a list of those community partners. So not everyone has ac- access right there at their fingertips. So sometimes we do have to be creative with the access. So not every, ac- not every system has the same things, and which I think that's what we have to be mindful of. And know. One of the things Dr. McCluskey mm-hmm. talked about too was um, there's a, a, a shortage now of therapists out there. And so mm-hmm. I find even with our agencies that work within our school, there's a long wait list. Mm-hmm. And it's very hard to get those kids in crisis the help that they need right away unless they're going in through a hospital. Absolutely. And even then, it's it's a little tricky sometimes. So the more kids that we see coming out of Cleveland State, the more helpful that will be because mm-hmm. there is quite a large shortage right now of therapists. Mm-hmm. Okay. So I'm the only non-counselor at the table here. Mm-hmm. And I don't really know. I mean, I know what wait list mean, but I don't really connect wait list to mental health services. Mm-hmm. Tell us about that. It's exactly what it sounds like. I have a student I might make a referral for, but the a therapist at my school, the Ohio Guidestone therapist, may already have a full caseload and can't mm-hmm. take anybody else. So we have to wait until she closes out somebody due to they've either finished their therapeutic model or they just are not coming anymore. Mm-hmm. And then when that one person leaves, then another one can come in. So there are times where mm-hmm. kids have to wait a month, six weeks for their first appointment. Mm-hmm. So, Dr. McCluskey, along this idea of waiting, uh, to me, it's easy if I see a person with uh, a broken arm, Mm -hmm. then I can say that person needs immediate attention. Mm -hmm. Or if I see a person that has um, fallen over and hit the head on a corner, Mm -hmm. 
Mental health needs are not easy to see. Is that why we have such wait lists? I think that that's probably part of the reason. And I think, too, that a lot of times we it's hard for us to admit to ourselves that we're not doing very well. You know, it's like when we, when, you ha- when we have a cold or a headache, we take Tylenol, we just kind of push through and try to act as if everything is okay because there's stuff that has to get done. And with mental health things, sometimes it, it helps to push through. But sometimes the things that are causing us to have those symptoms are not so readily fixable. And and so we, we, you know, we kind of go along and try to do the best that we can. But, you know, p- people around us are noticing maybe that we're not getting things done the way that we should. Or maybe we're not in as good of a mood. Uh, but we don't necessarily make that connection. Um, and so, I, and plus, it's hard to go in and talk to somebody about things that are bothering us when we'd rather just go on about our lives. And so I think for a lot of those reasons, it's really difficult. And so when somebody finally finds the energy and the courage to make an appointment to go in and talk to somebody and then they have to wait six weeks Mm -hmm. it's way easy to just put it on the back burner and just go oh things it's going to get better I don't really have to talk about this so we know from from research that the closer in time between when a person makes a counseling appointment and when they're actually seen the more likely it is that they'll keep that first appointment and then they'll continue with their counseling and you know maybe maybe it's only going to take a couple of conversations or you know a couple of visits to figure out what they need to do to to do better but it's it's getting people in the door for that first appointment that's so tough and those long wait wait times decrease the likelihood that people will keep their appointment okay thank you so now let's narrow down from community and look more specifically at how families can support teens with mental health issues Mm-hmm. So what can families do if they believe or if, if teens have indicated that they are in need of help? Mm-hmm. One of the things that I'm finding in school now is a lot of times these mental health issues run in families. So if a student is depressed, then perhaps their parent is depressed and that becomes the normal of the house. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, a lot of times I'll call home and a parent doesn't see what I see because they're feeling the same way as well. So any conversation that we can have with parents and to educate parents and to get them understanding that, you know, how they feel, they could feel better and their kids could feel better. Those conversations are very, very important to get started as soon as possible. Mm-hmm. So, Miriam, if there is a degree of normalcy to what is actually a mental health issue, then is it possible that a person does not recognize it in themselves and their child? Absolutely. I've made lots of referrals for parents or lots of family counseling referrals because it becomes part of the family dynamic, the mental health issue. And it, you can't f- help the student in isolation. You've got to ho- fa- help that whole family dynamic. Okay, thank you. Dr. King White. Yeah, so when we think about the family, the family is really important. I think one of the main things, and I encourage families to always do this, is listen and pay attention to their children when they're being faced with different mental health challenges or concerns. And these things come up in different ways. So if our children are acting different at home, I encourage parents, take a look at it, ask the children, and come out and have frank conversations. Um, I do know, just from past experience, sometimes when we think about cultural differences, when we think about mental health and the stigma around mental health, sometimes people don't want to talk about it. But I often tell parents, you got. We have to have these frank conversations about how our students and children feeling, and what kinds of services that children may need in order to feel better, um, in order to thrive within the academic setting. That's at the end of the day. That's what we want is for our teenagers to be able to thrive academically as well. Thank you so much, Dr. McCluskey. What can families do? So, you know, I, I completely agree with everything that um, Dr. King White and Mrs. Armstrong said. So, it's as a parent, uh, I'll talk. I'll talk more in my role as a parent than mm-hmm. as an educator at this point. It's really difficult for a ch- for a, k- a child to come home and say, you know, I, I'm depressed. And I think I need to talk to somebody because then I feel maybe like I have done something wrong or they're going to go in and talk to the counselor about some way that I'm a crummy parent or, you know, it's hard not to take that personally. Mm -hmm. And yet it's really important when when a child is expressing a need for help or expressing a need for a difficult Uh, noticing some difficulty in the family that we really listen to that and take it seriously even though it might feel a little bit threatening to us personally Mm -hmm. because Mm -hmm. um, 
yeah, it's just <clears throat> there's a ten we have a tendency to want to avoid talking about things that are uncomfortable or that that you know that are hard for us to look at. But those are the very things often that we do need to kind of lean into and look at in order to make things better. All right, Mrs. Armstrong. Well, I, I definitely agree with that. Even as a school counselor, mm -hmm. um, we had some issues in our own family. Mm -hmm. And it was hard for me to put aside that ego and say, you know what, I'm helping everybody else, but look, I need to help my own child. So okay. I totally hear exactly what you're saying. Mm -hmm. And I think part of the process with parents, too, is just taking that step and putting your child first. Mm -hmm. And for, for me, it was that whole process of taking my child to counseling that was the process that worked us through. Mm -hmm. So the counseling helped its, itself, but it was that time that I spent in the car going and coming, talking to them, and helping them process what they learned in therapy was, was really important. I just, I just want to jump on and say what, one of the, so what, what Mrs. Armstrong is talking about is the meta message. In other mm -hmm. words, it's not necessarily the content of what the child is talking, what, what your child was talking to you about, but the fact that you were A, taking it seriously, and B, taking time out of your day to take them to the appointment and be there with them during the appointment, that those behaviors communicate mm -hmm. how important mm -hmm. your child is to you and mm -hmm. how important their health is to you. And you you know, that, those are the types of things that I think can really strengthen a family unit. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we'll move on to our final uh, question for this segment. And as difficult and as horrific as the pandemic has been on all of us, and it apparently has hit teens particularly hard, mm -hmm. can any of you think of any good that has come over the last three years regarding teen mental health? Have any positives emerged in the past three years? I think we're talking about it more. Mm -hmm. I think Absolutely. even the media is talking about it more. Mm -hmm. The kids are talking about it more. And there's less stigma mm -hmm. around mm -hmm. not being okay. Absolutely. I don't think ever in our history has it been more okay to say that you're not doing okay because everybody was struggling. Mm -hmm. So in, in the past, if you looked around and everybody else looked like they were doing okay and you thought that you weren't, then you felt then there was again that stigma. But now every you know because we were all in it together, mm -hmm. it's made it more socially acceptable to admit that things could be better that that we're not feeling as well emotionally as maybe we would like to. Mm -hmm. I agree with everything around this. And I love it now that more people, like Ms. Armstrong and Dr. McClesser are saying, more people are talking about mental health. And I think K-12 schools, that of course, they're talking about it more. They're also seeing the importance of school counselors in schools now. Um, I sit on the ASCA board, and, and now we're seeing people asking for more school counselors in, di in different districts. Another thing, too, that I love, too, there are some school districts that are creating these calming rooms. And these calming rooms are safe spaces for students to go in and sort of decompress um, before the pandemic you had some schools that talked about it but those rooms normally would be used for students with disabilities now they're normalizing it how important it is even for teachers to have safe spaces to be able to go into so those calming spaces I've, I have found that those are really good too so the pandemic it was it's been, it's been hard on everyone's mental health including educators the school mm -hmm. counselors but I definitely think it's important yeah Okay, Mrs. Armstrong, you have another comment? I agree. I, I think that we're, we have an, we're all in this together mentality. Yeah. Um, we've done a lot of trauma-informed training with our staff. Mm -hmm. And I love how you said our staff felt traumatized at some point, too. Yeah, absolutely. So mm -hmm. um, we do have an all, we're all in this together. And, and I love that term. It takes a village mm -hmm. to raise a child. Mm -hmm. And it, this has really brought us all together. And we're focusing where it needs to be on mm -hmm. our kids. Mm -hmm. okay. I love it. Uh, would any of you agree that as a society we are suffering from more mental health issues or is it simply that we feel more free to discuss those issues? I think both. Mm -hmm. I think both. Mm -hmm. I think our, our, our folks are a little less resilient than they were. You know, maybe when my, my dad came over here as a refugee from Hungary. I mean, mm -hmm. he didn't know the language, and he, mm -hmm. was, he was successful. Um, our kids are a little less resilient than that, but we are talking about it, and we're training them, and we're teaching them and supporting them, so it, it'll come. Mm 
Mm-hmm. I have okay. hope. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, I agree. I, th- I think if, if you just look at what's going on in the world and what's been going on in the world over the last decade, let's say, with the extreme weather, you know, violence in, 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 in society and, and so the economic pressures and work at workforce stuff and then pandemic on top of it, I think that there's more existential angst for everybody with mm-hmm. good reason. I mean, it's based in reality. And at the same time, we have this av- avenue, this ability to use technology and to use some of these ways that we have of connecting to really try to move toward shining the light on mental health more and helping mm-hmm. people become more aware of ways that they can respond and think about things that are more that are more conducive to having um, good solutions to problems that are coming up. Mm-hmm. Okay. Absolutely. Do you have a final word, Dr. King White? I think we've covered a lot of it. I think, again, just that importance of everybody just supporting mental health. And in our K-12 schools, us continuing to support students socially and emotionally, those are just the key factors. But I'm happy that we're having this conversation here within our community. Okay, so I'd like to thank all of our guests for joining us today. Uh, Dr. Dakota King White from Cleveland State, Dr. Kathy McCluskey from Cleveland State, and Mrs. Miriam Armstrong from Palmer's, um, Palmer High School, Palmer mm-hmm. City High mm-hmm. School. Mm-hmm. So uh, don't forget the Teen Mental Health and Safety Summit will be at Rocket, Field, uh, Rocket Mortgage Fieldhouse October 10, and um, it's greatly supported by the Cavaliers and particularly Kevin Love. So thank you for joining us, and have a great day. Thank, thank you, you, Dr. Hinton. Thank you.